Thank you, America. Thank you for everything you've done for Israel. The United States of America has existed for more than 230 years. In these past centuries, the U.S. Constitution, based upon the Declaration of Independence and the laws of nature, has served as the blueprint for the American dream. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For some people, the American dream is having an a lot of material things, you know, having a bigger house, having a bigger car, being able to take expensive uh, vacations and that sort of thing. But whichever your interpretation is, the American dream does rest upon a society that is prosperous, and a prosperous society can only come from a society that is also free. Unfortunately, the American dream has not been available to all. Because of this, some have grown disenchanted, not only with the Constitution, but with America itself. Sadly, the American dream is dead. I... Some have called for a new America, an America 2.0, or at least new political parties. It's political, but the political consequence comes from a philosophy and the ideas. And we have been living for over a hundred years with ideas which challenges the basic concept of what the country's supposed to be all about and what the founders thought it should be. Perfect safety is not the purpose of government. What we want from government is to enforce the law and to protect, uh, protect our liberties. Others have called for no political parties, and still others want no government at all. These maintain that taxes are theft, war is murder, debt is slavery, and all are products of the statist mentality. We have higher taxes, we have inflation, we have job insecurity, we have unemployment, we have illegal wars overseas. Government issued license, fees, permits, permissions, all of these things that complicate the American people's normal daily routines. Most, however, simply want a limited government, a government that provides enough security to guarantee liberty while acknowledging and respecting our inalienable rights. We're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that it's self-evident. He was referring to natural law. He referred to the law of nature and nature's God in that same declaration. What can be said about natural law is that, number one, it precedes all human law. It is ultimately the basis for all human law, and all human law must be consistent, at least with the basic principles of natural law. 
that means that governments cannot make claims to omnipotence, as it were, because governments themselves are the products of natural law. But in asserting these rights, citizens have all too often been met with excessive force, what could be called police brutality. And many have observed that this brutality has been escalating since September 11, 2001, with the passage of the Patriot Act and the formation of the Department of Homeland Security. Department of Homeland Security, they were spawned out of this Patriot Act. If we didn't have that Patriot Act, we wouldn't have had this whole bureaucracy, this infrastructure, militarized police state, primarily through the Department of Homeland Security. First in the name of the war on drugs, then later in the name of the war on terrorism and the war on crime, we've seen a, an escalation in the militarization of the police and an increasing mindset among police officers, well, I'll do whatever it takes to get home alive, and they're forgetting their oath. Their first obligation, above all other obligations, is to defend the Constitution. The U.S. founders knew there would be times like this, and this is why they gave us the Bill of Rights. More specifically, this is why they gave us the Second Amendment, the amendment that guarantees not only these rights, but America's freedom. To this end, the Second Amendment states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What part of infringed don't you understand? And I was asking that to all the lawmakers in the country who pass gun control laws, because it's not that hard of a word to get. And the synonym that I really like the most is hinder. You can't hinder my possession of firearms. Do background checks hinder my right to keep and bear arms? Do waiting periods hinder my right to keep and bear arms? Do all these other regulations about what kind of gun you can own how much ammunition you can own, and, and all these other 20,000 gun control laws in this country now, do they hinder the right of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms? Absolutely they do. They're all unconstitutional. They're all infringements regarding the Second Amendment. Let's be real clear here. We're talking about the supreme law of the land. The Bill of Rights is the supreme of the supreme laws of this country. Gun control in the United States of America is against the law. But what exactly does this mean? It means that a free state is only possible when we the people insist on our right to be armed, not only as individuals, but as members of state militia. In the old world order, an order which prevailed in England, Germany, Russia, France, and other countries governed by monarchies, dictatorships, and oligarchies, only the sovereign, the state, was armed. In other words, the government claimed that only it had the right to keep and bear arms. As a result, such governments enslaved and murdered hundreds of millions of people over the centuries. In order to avoid this fate, the framers of the U.S. Constitution turned the old world order upside down. They created a new world order, where power was held by the subjects, not just the state. Thus, for the first time in history, the subjects became the sovereigns, and the government became the servant. The new world order that George uh, Bush referred to was a, a global government uh, whereby the major corporations of the world would control the global economy, which would require a global military to enforce uh, along with global government. Um, the, the New World Order concerning our republic was a resistance to uh, the globalistic approach to government that Europe had been exercising for many hundreds of years previous 
to the formation of our country. Uh, our modern leaders are trying to take us back to the old world order, because that's where we're headed. The founders realized that the only way reversal could be maintained was if the people themselves were armed and well organized. For they understood that he who controls the weapons controls the political power. They also understood that any government, no matter how well-intentioned, has the potential to abuse political power, to go rogue or become tyrannical, enslaving or murdering its citizens, usually in the name of national security or some other necessity. It's simply the nature of the beast. Just like corporations are capable of trampling people for profits, governments are capable of trampling people for power. The primal nature of government is a, is a topic which uh, has captured my uh, imagination for many years. Do we really want a government? Does anybody want a government at all? Uh, and the answer is, of course, you've got to have government, right? Otherwise you have anarchy. But uh, what does government mean? What does the government do? Well, the purpose of the government, by definition, is to govern. Now, does anybody want to be governed? I can't think of many people that want to be governed. And so maybe what we should be asking is, what is the proper function of the state? Let's use a different word, and things begin to be easier to analyze. The state doesn't have to be a government in the sense of governing people. When the American Republic was created, it really wasn't the government, even though our founding fathers called it that because that was the word they inherited from the old world. What they created was a protectorate. The purpose of our republic was to protect us, not to govern us, to protect our lives, our liberty, and our property, and that was it. In my view, the proper function of the state is to protect the life, liberty, and property of its citizens and nothing more. Given these immutable realities, the citizens of any country are wise to demand not only the right to keep and bear arms, but the right to be organized and well-trained in their effective use. Further, this is not some right bestowed by government itself. It's a natural right, a right bestowed by nature's God, the universe, or whatever one wants to call it. This right, as acknowledged in the Second Amendment, is an insurance policy. It's the only thing that guarantees a check and balance between citizens' rights and state power. It's the only thing that guarantees a free state. A free state is one in which the police understand that their police power is an extension of and emanates from the people themselves, and all the police are are acting as agents for the people. They're not a class apart from the people. As the Second Amendment says, that a free state is based upon the ability of the people to provide for their own security, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, and a well-regulated militia being, of course, composed of the people themselves exercising the right to keep and bear arms. Now on the other side, a police state would be one that essentially contradicts or neglects all of the principles of a free state. Rather, it is based upon some self-selected, self-perpetuating, self-aggrandizing elite controlling that society through police tactics. And ultimately, police tactics are the imposition of the commands of the elite through force or the threat of force. But if the Second Amendment makes it clear that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, why do we have a police state forming around us? Are citizens becoming more unruly or violent? Crime statistics are down. One of the worst crime rates in America used to be Detroit, Michigan. But the police chief, James Craig, uh, who I quote in my book, uh, Are You a David? This is all in here. And he said that crime is down in Detroit. Criminals are finally getting the message that good Detroiters are armed 
and will use that weapon. So why are scenes like these happening across America? Police attacking a mother taking her kids to school. Shooting a guy in a wheelchair, a guy with a pillbox, or shooting a child with a toy gun. A little black boy! Why are the police so trigger happy? Why don't they stop applying force, even when a citizen screams, I can't breathe, 12 times? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. The police state is the concept that the people are really the enemy. A police state grows apart from the Constitution, apart from any limits, and that's why you have SWAT teams coming to take care of situations that involve no hostage, no life-threatening situation. The excessive use of force could be stopped were offending officers convicted of police brutality and given serious sentences. But when was the last time you saw a rogue law enforcement officer get anything but a slap on the wrist? If the Attorney General were to reprimand uh, rogue police for brutality, uh, we'd have a situation that would involve the Department of Justice enforcing some of the specific criminal laws of the United States against those rogue police officers. And two come to mind immediately, Title 18 of the United States Code, Sections 241 and 242. Those particular provisions deal with violations of civil rights under color of law. So they would clearly reach activities by rogue public officials in acting in some police capacity because the police are always acting in some way under color of law. Those civil rights would include rights such as the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, which tend to be the categories of rights that rogue police officials uh, infringe upon. Now what's interesting about those two provisions is the seriousness of the penalties that are involved. Both of them state that a violation of civil rights where death results to the victim is punished by life imprisonment or the death penalty. So given that many of the episodes of police brutality that occur in this country in fact do involve the death of the victim you're talking about extremely serious penalties that could be applied in those situations. And Section 241 of Title 18 refers directly to conspiracies to violate civil rights. So that would tend to bring in the situation where within some police department you had policies, practices, training or whatever that was leading the individuals to engage in violations of civil rights on the streets and that would then cause those people who were in policy making decisions to be subject to criminal prosecution which of course would deter that kind of action institutionally. It seems as if public officials are not even trying to stop police brutality. In fact, it seems as if they're training and deploying police for more of it. It definitely is to get us used to a military presence amongst us on a regular basis so that we're comfortable with it and we accept it. I would say that a police state was seen on Clive Bundy's ranch when the BLM came in with a SWAT team to collect what they thought were grazing fees owed to their agency. That is a police state mentality. The founders told us in their wisdom that we must be the militia, right? It is necessary for the security of a free state. You will not be secure, you will not be free without it. Places like Fort A.P. Hill, which were built to train soldiers for urban warfare in Iraq, now contain mocked up American towns, complete with fire hydrants and handicapped parking slips. When the Boston bombing happened and they were searching house to house, uh, going through Watertown, uh, Massachusetts, and dragging Americans out of their homes at gunpoint, that was an example of a police state. So, and of course, in the end, who found the fugitive, the, the accused bomber? It was a homeowner who happened to notice that his cover for his boat was out of place, went and looked in the back, saw the guy. That's how he was located. 
None of that heavy-handed, militarized, rolling down the street in, in armored carriers and pointing guns at everybody, none of that did any good whatsoever to find him. Is all this preparation for the war on terror? Or are the powers that be trying to acclimate we the people into accepting an increasingly militarized police presence for some other reason? The answers to these questions may be all around us. There certainly is evidence that someone is trying to acclimate average Americans to an increasingly paramilitarized police presence and police activities that could be described as martial law because we see this is what is in fact happening. Uh, automatic rifles, uh, uh, camouflage outfits, armored personnel carriers, you go down that list. So we're seeing this more and more, but you ask the question, well, why would it be happening? The answer is, well, someone wants this result in the sense that someone wants these police agents to be capable of functioning this way, and in fact wants them to be functioning this way if it does not result in their being prosecuted either civilly or criminally. Since 9-11, over $5 trillion has been spent on the so-called War on Terror. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Quickly ushered through Congress only four days after the attacks, the Patriot Act has spawned thousands of laws ostensibly aimed at increasing national security. It is becoming obvious that there must be a lot of money going into it because if everybody's a terrorist or a potential terrorist, you go to the airports and everyone's treated as such. Um, there's an endless amount of ideas uh, available to those who want to uh, call out the terrorist card and use whatever means they can in order to gain more business from the business of terrorism. To this end, the Patriot Act has also spawned endless departments, agencies, protocols, tactics, industries, technologies, weapons, and a mind-boggling surveillance state that eviscerates the Fourth Amendment. Checking people's library records, the NSA wiretapping and listening in on everybody's computer fax and uh, cell phone transactions. The Patriot Act, uh, one of the worst laws in American history, one of the stupidest laws in American history, one of the most tyrannical laws in American history, one of the most destructive laws in American history to our personal freedoms. And they promised us they wouldn't use any of these tactics that they were allowed to do and wanting to use to go against terrorists, that they weren't going to use any of that against American citizens. So far, that's all they've used it again. In Bluffdale, Utah, the federal government recently completed a one million square foot data center that can store a quadrillion gigabytes of personal emails and phone calls. I ask, where are we going to stop that? Every sheriff in America, every cop in America should tell the federal government, you're not going to do that in my jurisdiction. And we know now this for a fact because Edward Snowden, the American whistleblower, exfiltrated thousands of documents from the spy masters at the NSA. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them. People knew, in numerous occasions would come up to me and they say, I know Ron, you want to defend civil liberties, but we're under attack and we have to sacrifice our liberties. It was that attitude that the congressman responded. Not only that is, there were people in Congress for many years before the Patriot Act was passed that had plans for this, but they never had the incentive to do it. They never could get the support from the people. So it was the mood of the times, people willing to sacrifice their liberties for a sense of security. But Benjamin Franklin was very clear, you know, if you, if you sell out your liberty for security, you end up with neither. And unfortunately, that's where we are today. Rogue politicians have been seizing and searching Americans' papers and effects in a blatant violation of the Fourth Amendment, which says people have the right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. We have the technology now 
to literally uh, monitor every single action and every transaction, every conversation, uh, everything that the American public are doing and the Patriot Act opened the door to a lot of that technology uh, being utilized um, in ways that were unimaginable uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Snowden's revelations also prove that major U.S. corporations have sold out to rogue politicians to facilitate NSA spying on American citizens, all in the name of security, supposedly justified by the necessities of a war on terror. What Edward Snowden did was to reveal things that were going on in our government that were not designed to protect America from her enemies. They were designed to give the government power over the people of America, not to give the government power over her enemies. And that's the thing that Edward Snowden picked up on. And that is what, in my view, made him a whistleblower and a hero. It may come as a surprise to rogue politicians in the District of Columbia and New York City, but the Patriot Act is not superior to the Fourth Amendment. The Patriot Act is subordinate to the U.S. Constitution and all of its amendments. This comes out of um, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution in Article 6, which states that this, this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and only those acts that are carried out pursuant to are legitimate and can be considered law. As we fully explored in an earlier film, Molan Labe, the Supreme Court has found that one, there is nothing in the Constitution that does not have legal import. And two, any law or statute that does not conform to the letter and spirit of the U.S. Constitution is null and void. There is nothing that is meaningless. There is nothing that is superfluous. There is nothing that is temporally bound in the sense that it applied in the past but doesn't apply today. And there is nothing that is capable of being set aside or disregarded on the basis of some other purported law. Now, if you ask why people would, would question, in some sense, the legal import or the continuing legal import of parts of the Constitution, uh, my answer would be is, well, they're trying to get around those provisions in some way. Not only has the Fourth Amendment come under serious attack, so has the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court in Ex Parte Siebold assures us that any unconstitutional law is void. Thus, any gun control legislation that attempts to infringe upon a citizen's right to keep and bear arms is also null and void. This is a cautionary tale about what happens when the Democrats completely lay down on an issue and let the right get whatever they want. You get insanity. Well, the Supreme Court has ruled on multiple occasions that an unconstitutional act is not a law, is no and void from inception, and imparts no duties and obligations, and refusal to comply with it incurs no penalties. Things like background checks, waiting periods, bans on guns or accessories, all unconstitutional. You don't see any authority for Congress to be passing any type of gun control law. Stand your ground, guns in bars, guns in church, guns in the classroom. Where does it end? Why not guns in the delivery room? <laughs> what if my fetus is armed and comes out firing? Even Congress and the President of the United States may not use necessities, like the so-called War on Terror, to justify violations of the Second Amendment or any other part of the Bill of Rights. 
Still, as clear as the Constitution is, rogue politicians appealing to bogus necessities have fathered bastard legislation like the Patriot Act. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. Americans have known wars, but for the past 136 years, they have been wars on foreign soil, except for one Sunday in 1941. And to add insult to injury, the crowning jewel of this act, the Department of Homeland Security, has been modeled after Heinrich Himmler's RSHA, a system aimed at incorporating all Nazi police departments under the control of what they called the Department of National Security. Sound familiar? You have to go back to the Nazi party and, and the way it was structured. And there was a guy named uh, Reinhard Galen, and he was a one-star general that was in charge of operations in the East, Germany, spying on the Soviets. As soon as he was brought to the United States, or immediately after, they created the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, and it was modeled exactly after Galen's organization. It was the precursor to the modern Homeland Security Act that came about after 9-11. The goal being to gain influence and ultimately control over the way state and local law enforcement agencies operate. That is the, if you will, the European pattern, to a large extent the Asian pattern throughout history of a Ministry of the Interior which controls the entire police structure throughout the country. That clearly is not, has never been in the past, uh, the American system of providing security. So it's a fundamental change uh, from our system under the Constitution and ultimately under the Declaration of Independence. In short, the Patriot Act, originated by rogue politicians that have no respect for the U.S. Constitution, is transforming America from a free state into a police state. They're mercenary forces. They're hired by the oligarchs running these giant cities as an extension of the Republican and Democratic parties in the, those regions, and they work for the for the bosses. None of them live in the communities that they police. Well, that's what a mercenary is. So, you know, it's time that the American people, I think, woke up and realize and recognize that that's what we've fallen into. A military police state, it's already here. And this police state opens the door to something as radical as full-blown martial law unless enough Americans become aware of the situation and resist it before rogue politicians invoke some necessity in the name of national security. We certainly have become a police state and it's all a desire that people want to feel safe and secure in order to do this, they have to sacrifice their liberty. And also it's extended to not only safety from outside sources, they want us to be safe from ourselves. And once they want to make us uh, uh, safe and secure by regulating our behavior, then there's nothing left for liberty. And that's where we are today. We live in a police state, uh, both because they want to regulate our personal behavior, they regulate the economy, and of course it's extended, and we think we have the moral authority to regulate and to police the world. And that's why we're in the mess we are in today. All this raises the question, is the war on terror the real reason the power elites are building the police state? Or is there some other reason? To answer this, let's put the war on terror into perspective. According to the National Counterterrorism Center and the Government Accounting Office, the U.S. government spends over $160 billion a year on the war on terror. Internationally, about 1,900 people are killed every year by terrorist acts. 
Of these, about 70 people are Americans. But each year, about 140 Americans die from peanut allergies, fully twice the number killed by terrorism. Yet there is no war on peanuts. Obviously, the war on terror cannot be the sole reason the power elite is spending all this money. So if not, what are they? The emphasis coming out of the Department of Homeland Security is not on the provision of those kinds of services. It is instead emphasizing paramilitarization of state and local police and the integration of state and local police to a large extent with the upper echelons of the government of Washington, D.C., that is the Department of Homeland Security itself, and the regular army or the National Guard. The real reason for the preparations must be something potentially so bad it would create chaos and widespread civil unrest. Well, now, what might that be? Well, it could easily be a breakdown of the national economy because of a collapse of the banking and financial structure. That would lead to massive amounts of social dislocations, civil unrest, and civil disobedience, probably, throughout the country. Recall 2008 when the financial system almost totally melted down. What if there is an even worse crash because bankers, financial magnates, and public officials have done little or nothing to stem the debt caused by the fiat currency system? A failure of the entire global banking system led by the collapse of the dollar might very well be the reason we see the police state build up. And if they were to collapse, I mean completely collapse, there would be economic chaos around the world. We are moving in the direction of an economic totalitarianism. If the system is not changed drastically, that's the kind of a system that we will be in. Might this be why the power elite is training and organizing men in black uniforms at every level of government? Why else would they be stocking up on hundreds of millions of rounds of hollow point ammunition? For them to buy a billion and a half rounds of hollow point rounds of ammunition, I mean, there aren't enough foreign terrorists on the soil. You don't use um anti-personnel ammunition for target practice because it's more expensive. Uh, you buy uh, another kind of cheaper ammunition. And so th the only thing we can uh, draw from that is that somehow the government wants to be able to effectively kill people when it shoots them. Now, if they actually were after terrorists, I wouldn't have any problem with that. But since uh, we've found that they are not really serious about dealing with terrorists and protecting the borders of the country, then the assumption has to be that we the people are the enemy. How could the global bankers not be aware that their fiat currency, debt-dependent banking system, is little more than a ticking time bomb? How could they not be worried about a crash? With an $18 trillion national debt, over $200 trillion in unfunded government liabilities and a global monetary base over 400 trillion Federal Reserve notes. How could they not be absolutely terrified about the Keynesian global monster they have created? 
In Keynesian economics, it is nothing but baloney. And uh, they think if they put some figures into a computer and make some unbelievably complex, ridiculous calculation, they can predict the future, and they've never been right. But one is a planned economy, an authoritarian economy, and it works for a while because it's based on borrowing money and debt and controls. And eventually, though, it always fails, just as socialism always fails. Mises, the great Austrian economist, predicted socialism can't work and the Soviet system would collapse, and he was absolutely right on this. Also, the Keynesian system, which is not quite uh, communist, fascist, uh, but a lot of intervention, what, what we practice, it's, de it's destined to fail too. The creation of the Federal Reserve was the vehicle by which our unconstitutional money system was allowed to perpetuate itself in this country. We were at that point taken off of the uh, of sound money principles. Uh, no longer would uh, precious metals be the formation of our economic system. But now then we authorized a private cabal of international bankers, the most of whom are not even citizens of the United States. And they have been given complete carte blanche to do with the economy of the United States pretty much as they see fit. The power elite has a serious problem. A banking system crash will undoubtedly be blamed on them because, after all, it was they who created it. We do know, a matter of fact, that they met in secret in Jekyll Island uh, at J.P. Morgan's hunting lodge, and they developed this current Federal Reserve System. It was made up of, of very wealthy bankers, and they devised this private banking cartel or cabal. Given this, their problem becomes, how do they survive a crash and not be stripped of their economic and political power? The answer would logically follow, use the trillions they have printed to finance a police state to protect themselves in the aftermath of a crash. Thus, the war on terror provides the cover to justify the enormous expenditures to do just this. In the event of civil unrest in this country, um, a person who is in current service who considers themselves an oath keeper would be under an absolute obligation and duty to refuse to go along with and to resist the mechanism, the only mechanism the Constitution considers for domestic emergencies is the militia. As it says here in Article 1, Section 8, the Congress has the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So in the event of domestic civil unrest or emergencies, if they're going to call up any force, if the national government is going to allow anyone to do anything in the United States, using military force to, to preserve um, the peace or public order, it would be the militia itself. Imagine the power elite, upon realizing that their banking system is going to crash, comes before the American public and says, we're really sorry about the fraudulent fiat currency Ponzi scheme we built, but it's evident that our Federal Reserve System is going to crash. We thus need several trillion dollars from you, the people, to build a police state so that we can protect ourselves from your rage once you have lost everything in the ensuing meltdown. The idea of the Federal Reserve System or the banking system collapsing and then imagining what it would be like is a kind of a scary thing because we know that uh, we depend on the banking system and the Federal Reserve to create the money supply. So the direct answer is there would be chaos if everything collapsed. When the authority structure in society breaks down, someone else will try to assert authority. So you may have authority being asserted from the ground up by rioters and looters in a really primitive fashion, 
you may have public officials attempting to reassert authority from the top down through martial law or some other form of repressing, or oppressing, suppressing, whatever word you want to use, the population. And then you'll have people in the middle that will be not sure which way they want to go, and then that will then lead to a kind of flux in society in which all sorts of lawlessness can take place. The power elite needs not only their buddies in government, but their buddies in the mainstream media. Thus, the New York and Hollywood brainwashing machine never stops beating out the mantra of war on terror and America under attack. And how to combat worldwide terrorism. In my opinion, you have to kill them. I my believe you have to well, kill no. the jihadists. So you kill. don't believe and that, that we should be terrorists. killing jihadist leaders. We are creating more terrorists. You have to look at the That's big picture. That's theoretical. Bill. But drone attacks that kill the leadership of the Al Qaeda and the Taliban are permissive. I mean, In other yes. words, war on terror equals necessity of police state. Never does banking system meltdown equal necessity of police state. All the while, the fiat currency money system is never mentioned in the mainstream media. Liberals like it because uh, they can direct the spending and they don't have to worry about deficits and uh, they can borrow money to the hilt for all their social programs. But somebody would say, well, conservatives are different. They're for balanced budgets. Actually, they're not. They, they like it because uh, they, they want the money and the debt to serve uh, the military and take care of their military industrial complex friends. And so they both like it for the same reason. It permits expansion of government uh, and abuse of spending and borrowing and inflation because on the short run, it looks good. It's just like you or I, if we can go out and borrow a million dollars a month, uh, we would be doing very well until maybe at the end of the first year, the bank said, well, you have to start paying it back. Well, the country has to eventually start paying it back one way or the other. They don't usually literally pay it back, but they have to pay it by, back by depreciating the currency, and that's what we're involved in right now. The $400 trillion monetary base of fraud and debt-backed paper doesn't even exist. Instead, day and night, somewhere on some TV network, the mantra of police, crime, Islam, and war on terror is pounded into the post-9-11 American psyche. Evening news on mainstream networks thus typically involve endless scenes of police shooting blacks, National Guard herding protesters, SWAT teams kicking in doors, and other authorities carrying out mini displays of martial law. There are two types of vice presidents, doormats and matadors. Which do you think I intend to be? You have two kinds of politicians that are considered rogue politicians. One intentionally will violate the Constitution for personal reasons or for the reasons of special interest groups who lobby him to vote certain ways on bills. The other type of rogue politician simply is ignorant about the, about the Constitution. A rogue politician who doesn't understand the Constitution may have every good intention and yet still violate the Constitution. And any violation of the Constitution is part of the definition of a rogue politician. MSNBC takes you behind the walls of America's most notorious prisons. Every weekend, MSNBC drops its regularly scheduled programming and subjects us to a slew of documentaries depicting life in the prison industrial complex. And the major studios in Hollywood do their part as well, for almost every one of their futuristic movies depicts a totalitarian police state complete with martial law. No, thank you. And all this is made as normal and legitimate as apple pie. Movies like Elysium, The Hunger Games, Minority Report, Dark City, District 9, Escape from LA, Judge Dredd, Metropolis, Robocop, and Total Recall endlessly depict a society that has succumbed to the police state and martial law. Yeah. 
images do affect human behavior. Uh, this has been well known and well established and the research is documented and proven um, over and over again. So why do they spend millions in advertising? To get people to do what the corporations want them to do, which is buy their widget, buy their car, buy their whatever it is they're selling. Okay. The movie industry effectively sends a message that martial law is inevitable and we have no other choice than to acquiesce to it. Movies have become actually pretty boring because they're all, all violent right now. Just complete uh, bloodlust and like the military industrial complex really. It has just escalated more and more. I find it them completely creating a bizarre reality, if you will, because I don't really see them as reality. And if they are, that if that is reality, that is pretty frightening to me. Aldous Huxley was a British socialist, and he had a projection of how socialism might go wrong in the future. And it bothered him to the point that he wrote the novel Brave New World. In five days' time, you will die. And so it would seem to me that the, the, the liberals in the media and in, in uh, Hollywood are concerned with something that they realize is a problem with them. They're the ones that are developing the police state in order to enforce their cancerous growth of regulation governing which is routine things that average people do every day. Thank you for your service. Yes, the Hollywood propaganda machine endlessly abets the globalist agenda because it validates the police state, legitimizes martial law, advances the myth of terrorism, and obfuscates the criminals in the Federal Reserve System and corporations that surround them. They influence the press, they influence the uh, radio and television, and they can shape the entire di dialogue on uh, everything that happens in our country. And they can do that because the special interests that have the money, that want to control what's going on in this country, can do that. The mainstream media promotes and facilitates anything the globalists and their lapdog governments want. The government is trying to test out uh, reverting to a King George's government. It's presenting us with all of these um, foreign laws, things that seems like they could be somewhere in the future if we're not careful, but they're actually being rolled out now. It's as if they're in a hurry to get something done. The top advertising clients of the mainstream media are many of the same corporations that service the military industrial complex. Big Pharma's drugs and the Federal Reserve's fiat currency. Keep them drugged, in debt, and fighting wars. That seems to be the purpose of the mainstream media, its sponsors, and government cohorts. It's not so much that the owners of the, um, the networks or the movie studios uh, issue directives to the producers and writers and say, this is what we want you to convey. Uh, they just uh, see what succeeds and what fails. And there's no doubt that um, those movies which produce uh, themes that are Contrary to the traditional American uh, way of life, they all get funded, they get uh, promoted and so forth. And so the new um, writers and producers see that and they just know by following example that they want to succeed, they have to do more of the same. Thanks to a redefinition of the word speech, we the people now enjoy less democratic control over the frenzy of mergers and acquisitions that have consolidated over 50 media companies into just six multinational corporations. The point is it's a very, very small, select, elitist cabal of people that for the most part control 
virtually everything that the American people watch on a screen or, or listen to on a broadcast are controlled by a very, very small handful of people. That's the point. Is it any wonder the average American is so brainwashed and confused about politics in America they keep voting for the same double-faced political party, or they don't even bother to vote at all? The positive has been the advent of the Internet. For all of the garbage that's on the Internet, we probably would have lost our freedoms years ago. The internet has allowed the free flow of information in the modern age, very similarly to the committees of correspondence in colonial America. They could not get their news from uh, the British government. Uh, they could not get their news from uh, the governors and, and so forth that represented the British government within the colonies. And so they started their own printing presses. They started their own newspapers. And they would ride on horseback and deliver uh, these uh, pieces of information to the citizenry. We should all thank God for the internet because it allows us to communicate with one another, circumventing completely the, uh, the, the small cabal that's controlling the, the major news that we see on television. Let's take a closer look at something one will never see on the mainstream news channels, the history of martial law. Martial law comes from the idea of emergency powers. Emergency powers were used in the old world order to ensure the enslavement of populations. For instance, in 1920, the United Kingdom enacted an Emergency Powers Act to give the king even more power than he already had, the power to declare a state of emergency and suspend all normal laws. The Nazis and Soviets had their own versions of emergency powers, and they used them to oppress and kill millions of their citizens. Now the basic concept there is that public officials claim that when some emergency arises, an emergency defined by them of course, that they are entitled to exercise powers that they would not normally be entitled to exercise in the absence of that emergency. And typically this results in the emergency power in one way or another overriding some existing limitation in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights in particular. So what we have is a claim that the exercise of powers of that kind is necessary. For instance, Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution allowed President Hitler to take any sort of emergency measures he felt necessary on any particular day. No consent from his parliament or the people even needed. Specifically, Article 48 uh, gave a mechanism by which the president could step outside and uh, issue emergency um, ordinances uh, by the lower house of the legislature. But nevertheless, that was a dangerous element in the Weimar Constitution and proved, of course, to be its downfall with use of that emergency uh, ordinances almost to the degree that regular legislation was used. And we're, we're seeing signs of that in our country now with this concept of people thinking that, well, gee, I can just re rule by decree. And of course, when the Reichstag building burned down, Hitler considered this his own personal 9-11. So what did he do? He used the fire to justify more emergency legislation and eventually was able to have all his real or imagined terrorists shot. The framers of our Constitution recognized that even a very explicit and limited type of emergency power such as finally appears in the Weimar Constitution was too dangerous to put into a constitution that was going to be the supreme law of the land. Either the constitution would be the supreme law of the land or someone interpreting an emergency powers provision would act as if he were the supreme law of the land. 
And that's why we see no emergency powers provision in the Constitution. And with the absence of an emergency powers provision in the Constitution, there can be no emergency powers acts or statutes or executive orders or other actions of that kind taken. 9-11 is being used to justify all kinds of excessive government measures to take away the rights of American citizens. Everywhere you look, you see government edicts and decrees and, and legislation uh, coming down the pike in the name of protecting us from terrorists. The Patriot Act, its emergency powers, its uh, executive orders are being issued, all focused back to 9-11. Stalin, in a slightly different management style from Hitler, simply kept his country in a constant state of emergency. This way, he could invoke emergency powers anytime he wanted and justify them with any necessity at all. And this worked out well. By starving and imprisoning millions of his citizens, he was able to solve all his problems quite nicely. There are those who have high positions in the government who want to see our system converted from a, uh, a state which has very limited powers for the government. They want to see it converted from that to an unlimited state, a totalitarian state, if you will, with those people themselves in control. And they know that the American people will never sit still for that unless they're scared, unless they're convinced that they have to do that in order to protect themselves from all of these terrible things. The point is this. There are no emergency powers in the U.S. Constitution. The founders knew they would be abused because every government from the Roman Empire to King George and Stalin abused them. The only powers that the government has are those in the Constitution itself, enumerated in the Constitution. And our Constitution is already geared, and already set up to handle any kind of so-called emergency. So you have, for example, you have the Militia Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to call forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, to suppress insurrections, and to repel invasions. That's the military, physical emergency clause, even though it doesn't even say emergencies. That's what you do in case of any of those things. There was no need for emergency powers to be written into the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution was forged during the worst emergency imaginable, the aftermath of war with the largest superpower on Earth, Great Britain. After experiencing this, the founders did not want to give the new American government any ability to act like another King George. We just cannot sit back and allow our government to um, trade away the freedoms and the liberties that our forebears fought so valiantly to bequeath to us. It is the obligation of each generation to defend liberty for itself and should not be abrogated by any generation of Americans. And nothing has changed to this very day. We the people can solve any emergency using the Constitution because the U.S. Constitution provides for the continuous solution to emergencies when properly applied and amended from time to time. No emergency power is needed. With this in mind, let's now look at martial law, the usual fruit of emergency powers. You know, we read a lot in the popular press as well as the uh, serious press and the scholarly press and the military press about martial law. Uh, one of the things that is almost as dangerous as the abhorrence of talking about such things in a casual sense is talking about it without de determining what exactly you mean by it. The beginning of a serious discussion of a serious issue is creating a taxonomy, defining what you mean. In brief, there are four types of martial law. Two could be said to be utilitarian. One is little more than treason, and the last is potentially healing. The first kind of martial law is the law used by the Army and Navy for their own members. This kind of martial law does not apply to civilians. 
Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 14 and 16 of the Constitution provide explicitly for that. Congress is given the power to provide rules and regulations for the governance of the Army and the Navy and then of the militia when the militia are in the service of the United States. Simply, strictly military law exercised or imposed on the members of our Army and Navy, as, as we may have an Army or a Navy of the United States, for their duration of their duty in that capacity. The second kind of martial law is only used in zones of actual warfare, where all civilian authorities have been destroyed or driven out. The justification for this type of martial law is that if the enforcement of civilian law is impossible, some other form of order should be set up for the benefit of the few civilians who cannot be evacuated. When we saw it happen during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, it was used uh, horribly and unconstitutionally and immoral. And then after the bombing situation in uh, Boston after the marathon, or during the marathon, the police used house-to-house uh, -house searches and de declared or acted like they had declared martial law. Martial law is used in times of war. If you're dealing with a combat zone, an area in which there is actual military combat, and there might be some civilians still scattered in that area or in the rear areas adjacent to it, then martial law, that is law enforced by the military authorities on the scene, would be essentially the only way to maintain law and order in that particular area. And so it would be justified on that basis. The third kind of martial law is not legitimate. Such martial law would be imposed by rogue politicians who would attempt to deploy the armed forces to oppress common Americans in the name of national security or some other necessity. Guns will be taken. No one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all yes, weapons. Sir. That happened today in this wealthy neighborhood where homeowners had armed themselves to protect their mansions. Such an action is actually an attempt to suspend the Second Amendment. This is treason because, as we have seen throughout history, every time a government has disarmed its citizens, for any reason or any necessity, those citizens are rendered defenseless against the police powers of the state. The unlawful use of military force, be it either the Army of the United States or Navy of the United States, um, to execute something outside of the law in place of the regular course of the law, and uh, the fact that uh, serious military people in military circles are, are contemplating in creating doctrine and in, in exercises is truly alarming. Unfortunately, some people simply don't pay attention to history. In just the past century, over 171 million disarmed citizens have been murdered by their good and trustworthy governments the claim of some military institution to set itself up as independent of and superior to the Constitution and laws of the country it has absolutely no basis in our Constitution. And in fact, it was one of the major claims in the Declaration of Independence uh, against King George III that he had attempted to do precisely that. That was in violation of the laws of nature and of nature's God and justified the 13 original colonies in declaring independence from Britain. To wit, quote, he has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power, end quote. Meaning, if King George could place his military law above civilian law, every form of tyranny could and would follow. Thus, as noted earlier, the colonists made no provisions in the U.S. Constitution for any sort of emergency powers that could invoke martial law or bypass civilian law. It's just not in the document. And no American alive today should believe that anything has changed. We, the people, still live under the same Constitution that detests and protects us against martial law. 
Well, if we learn about martial law from the movies and the media, we're going to learn the idea as it has come from those who want to keep aggrandizing government power. Every kitten grows up to be a cat. They seem so harmless at first, but once their claws get long enough, they draw blood. Martial law, in their view, can be applied, the rule of the military uh, can be applied anytime they declare an emergency. No, 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 your court order does not allow. Where is it? We're killing a cattle. In the late 1700s, William Blackstone, the founder's legal mentor, provided the most complete exposition of English law available to colonial Americans. In these works, Blackstone was highly critical of martial law. At one place, he stated, quote, the raising of armies and the regulation of the soldiery should be looked upon only as temporary and not as any part of the permanent and perpetual laws of the kingdom. For martial law is entirely arbitrary in its decisions. One definition of martial law is it's no law at all. It's just military force. Martial law of the third kind is illegal because it negates the supreme law of the land. Only the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and any law that does not align with and support it is, as we saw earlier, null and void. All of the laws that have grown out of the 9-11 attacks. We have now the Department of Homeland Security. We've got the Patriot Act. We've got the Military Commissions Act. We've got NDAA. We've got a, a growing police state on every, every level. Uh, our SWAT teams today are behaving more like uh, the um, war zone soldiers uh, than they are police officers. Uh, in, a, in a free republic. It is never God's will. It is never, has never been a Christian doctrine that Christian people submit to tyranny. And it is the duty of Christians and non-Christians alike to recognize martial law for what it is. It is the antithesis of everything our founding fathers fought and died to protect us from. So, in summary, all of colonial history supports the conclusion that martial law is arbitrary and risky. The Constitution does not provide for any Emergency Powers Acts. The Constitution does not provide for any laws to set it aside or suspend it. Martial law is thus utterly prohibited and a direct contradiction of the Constitution's legal supremacy. Even the President of the United States is not authorized to implement martial law. He has no legal authority to make any laws or set aside any laws, especially the U.S. Constitution. If there was a declaration of martial law, um, by the president or by any, by governors or whoever it would be, anyone in current service, whether military or police, who considers themselves an oath keeper, would be under an absolute obligation to refuse to obey any such order. Martial law is the absolute destruction of our, of our republic. Stuart, you're damn good. <laughs> <laughs>
servicemen, any military personnel, any police or sheriff, from violating the Bill of Rights or the other protections embodied in the Constitution. It's interesting that when Abraham Lincoln imposed martial law in 1863, and this was in the middle of a war, the Supreme Court later ruled that it was unconstitutional. This brings us to the fourth kind of martial law. The fourth kind of martial law is civilian law applied specifically by those martial institutions known as the militia of the several states. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 gives the militia of each state the power to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. The Constitution does not grant the Army or the Navy the authority to execute the laws of the Union. The Army and Navy only have the authority to execute the laws pertaining to their respective services. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. Congress shall provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union. And why do I call that martial law? Because generally speaking, you could say martial law is where some body of law is being executed, being enforced by a martial institution. Well, the militia are martial institutions, at least to a large degree. And here the Constitution gives the militia the authority and responsibility to execute the laws of the Union. Now what's interesting about this category of martial law is that term, the laws of the Union. We're not talking about the militia executing some laws that are outside of the Constitution, outside of the constitutional statutes enacted by Congress, but enacting or executing the Constitution and those statutes. So this is actually a form of martial law in name, which is really civilian law in character except being enforced by the militia because the circumstances would warrant the usefulness of the militia for that purpose. Again, only state militias may execute the laws of the Union. We have the militia of the several states or the militia of one state executing the laws of the Union or of a state when they are opposed by violent combinations too powerful for the regular course of the law. And that can happen under the constitution of a state or in the case of, as the constitution says, it, uh, repelling invasions or suppressing insurrections, executing the law or executing the laws of the union, that can happen in a federal capacity. Moreover, as the constitution mandates, the militia are required to execute all of the laws of the union, including the constitution itself. Thus, this form of martial law would always preserve a republic under the Constitution, never impose some dictatorship or oligarchy. Unlike martial law imposed by distant armed forces to repress people they did not know, in places they never lived, Martial law centered on the militia would always involve local militiamen familiar with the local population and local conditions. The militia uh, made up of citizens from throughout the community was a much better process than to utilize uh, police or military force to uh, uh, enforce laws because it was created by people that uh, uh, live in the community, they're members of the community, they're citizens within that community, and so the laws were designed to be uh, local by nature and uh, that they would work within the community to uh, provide uh, the minimal but the necessary amount of law to uh, function as a civil community. Thus, to a large extent, the members of the militia would be policing themselves. Unfortunately, a well-regulated militia of the constitutional pattern does not exist in a single state today. 
The rogues, tyrants, and bankers who are more interested in bringing about globalization than maintaining a free American republic have slowly segued we the people away from the militia system. Democracy is so overrated. The destruction of the constitutional militia of the several states really begins in 1903. At that point, Congress created a distinction between what it called the organized militia and what eventually it came to call the unorganized militia. The organized militia, it identified with the National Guard. The unorganized militia was everybody else. Now, the purpose of this operation was to remove most people from active participation in any form of militia organization. The unorganized militia essentially does nothing at all. But the National Guard does not have the characteristics of a constitutional militia. First and foremost, the National Guard is not a near universal compulsory membership organization. Where the National Guard actually fits into the Constitution is Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 which states that no state may keep troops or ships of war in time of peace without the consent of Congress. National Guard is the statutory structure by which the states and Congress have come to an agreement as to how the states will maintain their own troops or ships of war in time of peace. And what that does with the National Guard is to make it an adjunct of the regular army. Hurry up and get down the friggin' hill! Let's go, let's go, let's go! Stop right there! Carry the freaking bag! Carry it! The National Guard is part of the standing army, and that's why the National Guard went off to World War I, whereas the militia could not be called upon to go off as part of the army. So the goal of this operation by the people that set it up was to increase the size of the reserve forces that would be available for the regular armed forces that could be called upon when they believed that America should become involved in foreign military adventures of one kind or another. And on the other hand, to push everyone else into this unorganized category, which would in fact reduce the ability of everyone else to participate and influence the martial activities, if you will, of this country and of their various states. If those militia are actually functioning, very large numbers of people participating, influencing the process, being concerned with what was going on, paying attention, influencing their public officials in the executive branch and in the legislature. There'd be really more of what I would call a ferment of political involvement of people. Raise your hand now if you won't make that pledge tonight. Mr. Trump. So. Now there is none of that. And the great problem with this is that it leaves all of those people in the unorganized militia unprepared for the various crises or calamities, really catastrophes that you can imagine, that would threaten the security of a free state. They have also segued us away from the gold standard so they could literally print up the money to finance their police state in the name of the war on terror. These actions must be reversed. But who will reverse them? Who will challenge the globalists and their agenda of a one world totalitarian state? This question actually becomes one of who will reject martial law of the third kind were it ever declared? If children don't get the message about what a free society is all about, they'll grow up not knowing about it. And that's one of our problems that uh, we've had over the years. I think it's changing. This is where I'm an optimist. I think people have a easier access to alternatives through the Internet and homeschooling. And also they're being exposed. And I know young people are very fascinated with Austrian economics and, and reading about the uh, Federal Reserve. So this is crucial. Uh, that young people hear from here. And, and, and for me, why it works is I think we all have a natural instinct to want to take care of ourselves and be free people. And the system that we've had, whether it's the schools or the movies or the news or the books and all, it all teaches us to, to conform. You aren't compelled to loan your car to anyone who wants it. 
but you are compelled to surrender your school-age child to strangers who possess children for a livelihood, even though one in every nine school children is terrified of physical harm happening to them in school, terrified with good cause. We found a disturbing number of recent school shooters were either on medication or were experiencing withdrawal. Instead of encouraging individualism, they encourage uh, collectivism, they teach people that rights come in groups and these various things. So to me, it's crucial that the young people ha have this opportunity and they're very open to it. And uh, I see so many teenagers uh, that uh, come to rallies and have come to my office and, uh, and, and they're really excited about the issue of liberty because it is exciting and especially when you find out if you're really interested in peace and prosperity, which everybody claims, this is a real option. Uh, what we have in our governments today and, and in, in the establishment media, uh, there are, there's no uh, opportunity to promote uh, these views. Eric Hoffer, in his book, The True Believer, maintains that civil disobedience, often the advance of civilization, is dreamt up by men of words, executed by fanatics, and administered by practical men of action. Probably in the realm of one to three percent of the population are always the leaders, the movers and shakers that make anything happen in history. The other 97 to 99 percent of the people go along with their leaders, they go along with the rabble-rousers, they go along with whatever seems to be successful. Uh, they'll say, well, that's what I'm for. So I think it's important for us to realize that, especially today when we get discouraged and thinking, how will we ever get 51 percent of the people to support such and such a concept? 51 percent of the people will never do it and never have and never will. What we need is that 3% or less of well-informed, well-motivated, well-intentioned people that have no ax to grind except to preserve the liberty of themselves and their fellow citizens to get united and, and to get moving and to become active on whatever social or political reform is necessary because that 3 to 1% of the population can do it and in fact they always have done it and they always will. The American Revolution was an anomaly, for there were many more patriots than in most mass movements. The patriots, who Hoffer would term fanatics, comprised about 50% of the colonial population. These people thirsted for constitutional principles and had a fanatical desire to oppose the loyalists about 23% of the colonists who remained loyal to the tyranny of King George. Along with these two opposing groups, the Loyalists and the Patriots, there was a third group consisting of about 27% of the colonists. These people were neutral, what we would call fence-sitters, or what sociologists refer to as the attentees. Most people tend to not want to make waves, etc. Unfortunately, where we are in our society today, we can no longer afford that luxury. The powers that be and, and the forces that be are themselves pushing the envelope against the principles of freedom every day. Every day, we seem to be losing more and more of our God-given liberties. Every day our constitutional safeguards seem to be slipping away from us. Every day the Bill of Rights is trampled or ignored by the powers that be. And for citizens to take a wait-and-see approach now is to, in essence, go along with tyranny and allow evil to triumph. Given the history of mass movements, and especially American history, it's interesting to speculate as to who would comply with martial law were it ever widely declared today. Who would support the Oath Keepers and who would support the Oath Breakers? Basically two groups of people would oppose revitalization of the constitutional militia. The first group would be composed of average citizens who simply didn't want to participate. 
They didn't want to go to some kind of militia training exercise two or three times a year. They didn't want to acquire the basic equipment necessary to perform whatever militia functions they might be assigned. There's a second group that would oppose revitalization of the militia. And to understand who they are, you have to look at the first 13 words of the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. People who don't want a free state in this country clearly would be rabid opponents of anything having to do with revitalization of the militia. Even talking about the militia, they would oppose. What is a free state? A well, free state is one that's characterized by popular sovereignty. The people govern themselves, and ultimately they provide their own security through well-regulated militia in which they themselves exercise the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Undoubtedly, the group that would support martial law, what could be called the new loyalists, would most likely be the bankers and the corporations that rely heavily on bank loans, the fiduciaries that sponge off these transactions, the gun control lobby. These are people who would be in the forefront, and they in fact are in the forefront, of opposing anything that has to do with militia, enemies of the principle of a free state. Because remember, the Constitution does not say that a well-regulated militia is somehow optional, that it's a good idea, but we don't necessarily have to uh, abide by that concept. It says that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. That's the only institution that the Constitution says is necessary for any purpose, let alone for that most important purpose, the security of a free state. Journalists in the media, uh, and, and that would include Hollywood, are going to be apologists for martial law because they have the same view as the bureaucrats and the politicians that make such laws that the American people need to be regulated, uh, regulated uh, even down to minute detail. And so when they see this, uh, the kind of abuse that we have seen, such as uh, sending in uh, a BLM SWAT team to collect money from a rancher in Nevada when the court system was never availed, uh, that's the, uh, something that the media is not going to have a problem with. And the rancher, the I don't believe in the U.S. government rancher, dragged this stuff up out of the far right, rather pitiful fringe. The next group, what is traditionally known as the Patriots, would not in any way comply with the third kind of martial law. These would refuse to comply because they know their constitution and they know their inalienable rights, rights granted by the Creator. What's more, these patriots would ideally be well-armed and well-trained because they also understand what the Second Amendment is about and how the militia system fits into the plan set forth by the Founding Fathers. The American government is different from every other form of government on this planet. It is not hierarchical. It is not about concentrating power in the hands of a central authority. It's about the diffusion of power. They set up multiple states that each was autonomous, that had its own authority. The town, the city, the county, the state, the federal government, in that order. The American government is set up to diffuse power not to concentrate it, because as you concentrate power, you concentrate the corruption that goes along with it. The unfortunate thing is, due to the incessant brainwashing from the New York-based mainstream media, the Hollywood-based motion picture industry, the cultural Marxist-infested public school system, academia, and portions of the clergy, as much as 80% of today's population may be fence-sitters. Considering the fact that the, uh, the movement of history is always directed by a small number of people, yes, the future is always bright for activists because the future is always won by activists. The only question is, who are the activists? Are they going to be people like us who want liberty and freedom and justice, or are, are the activists going to be another group of people that want control over, over society? Uh, that's the only question. Which minority is going to win? 
So if you are a man or woman of action, the future is actually in your hands. Most others will do nothing, not even oppose you. It is hoped that you would loudly and clearly declare your objection to martial law, that you would resist martial law were it ever declared. And for those new loyalists who would disagree with your stance, it is hoped that you would remind them to consider this famous little phrase, if only Stalin knew. The phrase, if only Stalin knew, refers to the letters people sent to Stalin even as they were being put into the cattle cars and taken away to slavery or their deaths. These people couldn't believe the very gulag system they helped create that they were loyal to had turned on them. So they naively wrote petitions to Stalin thinking that there must be some mistake. If only Stalin knew, he would correct the mistake. But Stalin did know. In fact, it was he who put them, his loyal citizens, into the cattle cars. So I think that same mentality that we saw in Stalin's Russia, we're seeing again in the United States today where the people are unwilling to hold their representative, their congressman, their president, their senator accountable for the actions that are being done under their auspices and their authority. Everybody sees the results. Everybody experiences in one way or the other the results of what they established in the lawmaking process. And yet, when they come home to the people, and whenever they, they're confronted in a town hall meeting or whatever, the response is, oh, I don't know anything about that. They do know what's going on. Stalin did know what was going on. So if you are a loyalist, the globalists will probably act no differently towards you than Stalin did towards his loyalists. Imagine if citizens dared to disagree with the future being painted upon their retinas by the mainstream media. We're living off this news cycle on the television yeah. and tanks are running down our streets. This is not the way our government has been set up to operate. And this is what this whole terrorism movement is doing. So. 80% of the people are going to be confused because they're being conditioned over time is we only trust the government. We cannot fend for ourselves. We cannot protect ourselves. People have just fallen into this um, uh, complacency of not asking questions and not being involved in their government to ensure that we keep our liberty. It's, it's not free. You have to work for it. Imagine if such citizens rejected the war of terror, called for the end of police brutality, and declared that they are no longer going along with the mantra of martial law, endlessly spewed forth from the globalists' propaganda machine. The National Security Agency collects 1.7 billion emails and telephone calls and stores them every single day. The surveillance state and the police state are pretty much the same thing. A police state has to have constant uh, surveillance over all of the people so that they can monitor them and make sure they're doing exactly the right thing. Nobody's getting organized against them to you know, sniff out all the opposition and squash it before it becomes a strong force. That's what all police states do. And it's obvious that this is not uh, a good system to live in. We have to get rid of it if we want to live in freedom, if we want to live in harmony, if we want to have uh, security against the police state. I mean, what's the point of worrying about being attacked from some totalitarian system across the ocean if in order to do so, we have to build a totalitarian system right here at home. The U.S. Constitution is the engine of a new world order introduced in 1776. This order reversed the ancient roles of citizens and sovereigns and made the old world order of despots and monarchs forever obsolete. 
The breakaway was not only successful in establishing American independence and freedom, but the Americans created a republic, a new kind of government, which served as a model and gradually expanded freedom to all of its citizens. So America was a success, it was an idea, and it worked. Consequently, the world would look to the best in America for leadership. Leadership based upon the ideals of liberty, equality, and opportunity. And these ideals are embodied in the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Now, if you think of the Constitution as a, a, a kind of a legal structure, it has certain columns that are supporting the structure. Congress, the executive branch, the president, the judiciary, we the people in their capacity as the electors, the voters, those are the four at the corners. And then in the very center of this structure, there are the well-regulated militia, which the Constitution itself tells us are necessary to maintain the security of a free state, that is to maintain the integrity of this structure against whatever threats might impinge upon it. The only guarantee of a free people is eternal vigilance and a willingness to resist and oppose and fight what's going on. It is an eternal battle. And uh, the truth is that, uh, that Americans in some ways are less free than they have been in the past. And I think they're gonna have to do battle, political battle, to get those freedoms back. True security is a chore, lovingly provided by we the people at local levels. And how would they maintain that security? Well, we go back to the famous epigram of Mao Zedong, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Maintaining political power depends upon maintaining that ultimate source of force in society. So if we're talking about maintaining populist sovereignty, then it must be the people themselves who will have the power of the gun that will give them the ability to execute and maintain that political power in their own hands. But as wise and secure as our constitutional system is, the Constitution itself acknowledges that even it can be perfected. We are therefore always on a journey to form a more perfect union. And with each perfection of the union, America peacefully demonstrates anew that it is capable of accommodating an even wider universe of beliefs, speech, lifestyles, and freedoms. And even though Jefferson and Franklin and some of the other founders were not Christians in the traditional sense, they all understood the principles of natural law given us by our Creator. And you, you see these wonderful ideas uh, coming together. And what it did, it, it challenged the thousands of years of world history. And this dream, based upon inalienable rights guaranteed by nature's God, the deity, or whatever higher force you want to call it, is made possible by the unity of people and places over vast centuries of time. And securing this unity is the Second Amendment and the three militia clauses in the U.S. Constitution. For freedom is the keynote, and implicit in the idea of freedom is also the idea of freedom from. Freedom from excessive regulation and onerous laws. 
freedom from predatory taxation, debt slavery, and forced insurance. Freedom from surveillance, invasion, and perpetual war. In short, freedom from the police and surveillance state ushered in by the Patriot Act and its spawn. By having sovereign states with their own militias in the state, we go back to what the founders intended. If the president wants to execute the laws of the union, he should have to call forth the militias of the several states. If they disagree, they think it's an unconstitutional act by either the Congress or by the president, they could simply refuse to deploy so that the federal government cannot step in and use military force against you without the consent and the approval and participation of the state militias. And to guarantee the optimum freedom, the biblical-based, Blackstone-inspired U.S. Constitution has proven to be the most workable political philosophy so far created. People, comprised of immigrants from every nation, belief, and race, melted together under a common political philosophy and literally began the world over, as Thomas Paine observed 240 years ago. The, the cry in the heart of Thomas Paine, the cry in the heart of Jefferson and Washington, Patrick Henry, all of our founding fathers, was that they wanted a free, an independent nation whereby the people were the sovereigns of the country. It was a historic reformation of thought and ideology. The liberties and the freedoms of the people were more important than the opulence and the power of the rulers. It was revolutionary. It, it, it for ever changed uh, the old world and it brought into existence uh, a true a new world of, of freedom and liberty. America can be restored to her first principles by revitalizing the militia of the several states. A revitalized militia will provide better checks and balances between centralized federal power and local state power. And if we the people control both the power of the purse and the power of the sword, we can survive any catastrophe or change. The choices are yours. We need the Second Amendment more than ever, the amendment that disarms rogue politicians, bankers, and mainstream media. The amendment that arms we the people so we can continue to create an exceptional nation and lead by example, not by force.